بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Friends of the door Ladies and gentlemen, good evening The title and topic of tonight's lecture in jewels India is the treasury of the world The title has special meanings to Dar al-Athar al-Islamiyya This title of Dar's first major traveling exhibition, Islamic art and patronage, treasures from Kuwait, that was in 1990. Actually, it was in the Hermitage, as I remember, just one day before the Iraqi invasion. It was not only uses this terminology of uh, treasury of the world, but also presents examples of the vast variety of artistic works produced under the support of patrons such as Jahangir. The Sabah collection features a considerable amount of Indian art. From the Dar's face, first major traveling exhibition, Islamic art and patronage, treasures from Kuwait, to the recent jeweled arts of the Mughals, held in Toronto jointly between the Agh Khan collection and the Sabah collection. The art of India, particularly that of the Mughals, has held a place of honor and in the exhibitions of Dar al-Athar al-Islamiyya. This evening's speaker, Dr. Yushua Balakrishnan, will be presenting a special dimension of these treasures, that is, that of Indian jewelry. An eminent independent scholar, Dr. Usha will be discussing Indian jewelry in a way that far superpasses, sorry, surpasses a study of merely the jewels themselves, but also explaining the symbolism embodied in their forms and the historical and cultural periods in which they were formed. Dr. Usha is a scholar, author, curator, historian, and she comes to us this evening more than highly qualified to present India to our audience through its jewels. We should not demean such a discussion of the high context of Indian culture as manifest in the jewelry by being interrupted by, your, by the noise of your mobile phones. So be kind enough to turn off your mobile phones and let's welcome Dr. Usha Balakrishnan. Thank you very much for that introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really honored to be here in Kuwait to deliver this evening uh, on this occasion of the 24th uh, cultural season. Uh, I first would like to extend my sincere thanks to Sheikha Hassa, who couldn't be here with us this evening, and Sue Kakuchi for inviting me. It's really such an honor to be here. You already got an introduction just now about the Al Sabah collection. It made its first appearance on the world stage. The exhibition, as has been mentioned, drew its title, Treasury of the World, from Sir Thomas Rose, famous description of Jahangir. Stunned by the jewels Jahangir wore and the wealth that he saw displayed in the court, Roe proclaimed in a letter that he wrote to Prince Charles of England, and I quote, in jewels, he is the treasury of the world, referring to Jahangir, perhaps a sight not unlike the one on the screen in front of you, which was the miniature painting dates exactly to the time that Ro was in Jahangir's court. And I'm showing you on the right side a close-up of Jahangir, beautifully bejeweled, wearing the most outstanding pieces of jewelry. In the painting, he is weighing his young son, Prince Khurram, the future Shah Jahan, on the occasion of his birthday in, with gold coins, silver coins, and an array of jewels that you can see at the bottom. The allusion, treasury of the world, was apt. For the Al Sabah collection literally made the world gasp. No other collection of this quality 
and quantity, predominantly from the Mughal period, existed. Sheikh Nasser has articulated this in his introduction to the catalogue, and I quote him here, a very great problem connected with the desire to collect early and important Indian jewellery is that unlike other branches of art, there were few existing collections or publications for education and guidance. And one had little to follow but experience and a feel for beauty, rarity and quality. End of quote. But what Rowe saw on that day in 1616 was just a minuscule fraction of the immense wealth that reposed in India. Historically alluded to as the golden bird, or in Hindi, it's Sone Ki Chidiya. For thousands of years, the gems and jewels of India have captured human imagination. The adventurous, like Marco Polo, came in the 13th century, drawn by stories of the wealth of the East. He declared that the region contains, and I quote, most of the pearls and gems that are to be found in the world. In the center of the screen, merchants like the French jeweler Jean-Baptiste Tavernier made no less than six trips to Persia and India to buy Golconda diamonds, recording in his diary, and I quote, the diamond is the most precious of all stones, and it is the article of trade to which I am most devoted. And invaders like Nadir Shah on the right, descended in 1739, plundered the Mughal treasury, and carted away vast treasures, including Shah Jahan's peacock throne seen on, the, on your left, and the Kohinoor diamond. You can see Sher Shah actually wearing the Kohinoor diamond, Sher Shah, the Maharaja of Punjab. The treasury in India was the most important constituent of empire. Kautilya, author of a book called the Arthashastra, a 4th century BCE treatise on statecraft and economics, states, and again I quote, the king, the minister, the country, the treasury, the army are the elements of sovereignty. End of quote. Describing the treasury, Kautilya further declares that it should be rich in gold and silver, filled with an abundance of big gems of various colors, gold coins, and it should be capable to withstand calamities of long duration. That, he says, is the best treasury. Wealth accumulated in the treasury of India in a variety of ways. The rulers of the various kingdoms had to be offered the best gems that were mined in their kingdom or were offered for sale in the gem bazaars that lay in their territory. Nobles and vassals regularly offered what was known as Nazar or Nazrana, gifts of gold, gems and jewels as expressions of loyalty to the king. As you can see in this detail of a painting that depicts Jahangir, this is Jahangir, accepting gifts of jewels from Asif Khan. You can see the jewels here on a plate in his hand. Above all, vast quantities of gems and jewels flowed into the treasury in the form of war booty. Jewels were not merely decorative accoutrements for images in temples. The agamas, or rites prescribed for worship, stipulate that alamkara, or adornment with jewels, was an important part of daily rituals, and is so even today in temples around India. The belief is that ultimate reality, which is God, is formless and invisible, but assumes form and becomes visible through adornment. Thus, by draping images with clothes and adorning them with fabulous jewels, as you can see on the screen on the right, the god assumes an earthly persona. In this context, therefore, Alankara makes the invisible visible. The ceremonial dressing in temples culminates in the processional carriage of the deities around the temple 
to present the magnificent spectacle to the devotees. And for people around India, like the bride from Himachal on your left and the Naga, Konyak Naga on the right, jewels constituted savings. For a woman, jewels were her stridhan, wealth that she received at the time of her marriage. Jewels were also social barometers of affluence, power and status. Distinctive ornaments indicated caste and ethnic identity as seen in the jewels of the Konyak Naga. The hornbill feathers and wild boar teeth that are his headdress, you can see here, are a symbol of his status and rank in his community. Jewels were also worn to ward off the evil eye as amulets for good health, as part of rite of passage rituals. Jewels beautified, they seduced and maintained the human body in perfect equilibrium. Therefore, the range and variety of ornament forms in India is of cosmic proportions. Spanning a history of 5,000 years, spread across a geographical expanse of more than 3 million square kilometers, adornment in India is actually a way of life. Now, the population of India is 1.25 billion, and every single person, newborn, young or old, rich or poor, urban or rural, owns a piece of jewelry. From birth to death, jewelry in India is like clothing. It is an inseparable part of the human body. Through history, terracotta figurines, I can see on your far left, and sculptures in stone, bronze and wood from every period in history testify that while gods and goddesses and even human figures might lack clothing, they are almost never devoid of jewels. Poetry and literature are eloquent with descriptions of jewels. Inscriptions on temple walls record the receipt of magnificent gifts, and chronicles and diaries are filled with accounts of overflowing treasuries. It is the Indian jewelry is not just about gems or even about antiquity, quantity, or even just the Mughal period. It is a legacy that straddles history, science, religion, trade, craft, and even fashion. Stripped of their functional and symbolic meaning, the jewels of India hold their own as beautiful objects. Once again, I have to quote Sheikh Nazar, who wrote, in the end, however, it is the art of Indian jewelry. That's what he says, it is the art of Indian jewelry which has attracted me and driven me to explore its dimensions." End of quote. And it is the art of Indian jewelry that captivates me. Ever since I began my study of Indian jewelry, these powerful metaphors of adornment have fascinated me. It is what makes each jewel a work of art. So gathering gems and jewels that were crafted in the karkhanas or the workshops of the Mughals, that once reposed in the Tosha Khanas or treasuries of the Maharajas and lay in the walls, in the tijoris of families, I present to you all this evening my treasury, my dream treasury, to show to you all that not just Jahangir, but in jewels, India is the treasury of the world. Few items of really ancient jewelry have survived. Gold and gemstones were recycled into new settings. It was used as cash to fund wars and was looted by waves of invaders. So for my treasury and my selection from antiquity, I go back to where it all began, to the valley of the Indus and the city of Mohenjo-daro. The chronicle of Indian adornment starts with a simple bead. India was the bead manufacturing center of the ancient world. Hundreds of thousands of beads in different shapes and sizes crafted from lapis lazuli, chalcedony, carnelian, agate, jasper, onyx, and so on were discovered in excavations at Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. The necklace on the left, that one, is made up of jade, gold, banded agate, and jasper beads. Look close 
and you will see almost an identical one on the neck of the bronze dancing girl from Mohenjo-daro. The necklace on the right, at the bottom here, is strung with flat, disc-shaped gold beads interspersed with turquoise, agate and faience. Both jewels date to between 2600 and 1900 BCE. They are exemplars of the technical knowledge of metallurgy, skill in fabrication and the sophistication that was known more than 4,000 years ago. Also from antiquity are these fabulous royal earrings now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. They date to the first century BCE. The earrings are made from sheet gold and decorated with the winged lion and elephant. You can see it if you look very closely. And a vase decorated with minute granules and wire. The earrings are large and heavy. Each of them are three inches long. When worn, the earrings would have distended the ear lobes and rested on the shoulder. They are in intrinsically beautiful and display the superb quality of goldsmithing in this period, 1st century BCE. They are also important examples, historical examples, because as you can see here, this Yakshi from Bharut from the same period is wearing what looks to be an identical pair. My next selection comes from Sirka, Takshila, the capital city of the Bactrian Greeks, located on the ancient Silk Road. This collection of jewels on the screen are in the National Museum in New Delhi. They date to the first century of the Common Era, which makes them more than 2,000 years old. They are classically Greco-Roman in design, made from sheet gold and decorated with delicate wires microgranules the size of grains of sand, and cloisons inlaid with colored stones and turquoise paste. They also truly articulate the legacy of Indian craftsmanship in this early period. Diamonds were known in India 600 years before the Common Era. The Golconda mines in the Deccan supplied the world with this precious gem. So this earring on the screen in front of you is a rare piece that qualifies for my treasury. It's from the 12th century Sultanate period, set with three Golconda diamonds. The diamonds are in their natural octahedral form. You can see that. Their exposed faces polished to outline the natural facets. Importantly, the jewel establishes that the Indian lapidary was conversant with the art of diamond polishing 200 years before it was invented in Europe. References to jewelry in ancient Indian texts has inspired my next two choices. In the epic Ramayana, Rama's signet ring and Sita's head jewel serve as important elements in the plot. Sita had never met Hanuman the monkey god before. So Hanuman carries Rama's ring with him to Lanka to identify himself as Rama's messenger. While the ring on the screen, you can see here inscribed with the name Ram in raised Devanagari script is an allusion to Rama's ring. The ring was actually discovered, recovered from the slain body of Tipu Sultan after the siege of Serengapatam in 1799. The Silipadikaram is a second century text considered to be one of the greatest Tamil epics. The story in this book again revolves around a jewel, a golden anklet filled with rare gems, perhaps not unlike the one that you can see here on the screen in front of you. This one belonged to the Maharaja of Morvi. It dates to the early 19th century. This grand jewel has intertwined gold links which end in bud-shaped finials encrusted with diamonds and capuchon rubies. Now, Shringara, or adornment, is among the 16 rituals of beautification prescribed for a bride in India in preparation for her wedding. It comprises a whole array of ornaments, from the top of the head to the toes. 
ornaments, it is believed, transform a bride from a temporal being into a divine goddess. The marriage necklace is one of the most important rite of passage rituals for a woman. This magnificent necklace on the screen is known as the Kalitir. It is the marriage necklace of a community called the Natukottai Chuttiyar in South India. The necklace is made up of elaborate claw-like pendants. You can see these claw-like pendants, which are believed to be inspired from shells and from crabs. It was a seafaring community at one time. The jewel is crafted from sheet gold, and exquisitely detailed with wire work. The verse alongside, if you can quickly read it, is an anonymous, one by an anonymous poet from the 8th century that describes a beautiful bejeweled bride. In the category of year jewels, my choice was vast, but my selection was not difficult. This is the two earrings that you can see on the screen in front of you are known as the palm badam and tandati. They are jewels of stunning abstraction. They are the most enig enigmatic earrings in the repertory of Indian jewelry. In both jewels, circles, triangles and squares are juxtaposed in a brilliant grouping of forms. You can see here squares, circles, triangles, the Tandati, the one at the bottom, is pyramidal in structure, while the one on top has a minuscule image of a cobra, its pointed tapering hood clearly visible, if you can see the cobra. These earrings are worn by women on the right of the Vellalar Nadar caste. While the origin and antiquity of the forms is not known, local beliefs attribute the designs to stylized versions of snake earrings worn by Lord Shiva when he danced the cosmic dance of creation. They are timeless in their elegance and laden with infinite symbolism. Another set of earrings I love for their beautiful craftsmanship are these two historically important examples. The pair on top is from the Al Saba collection and dates to the 17th century. The floral forms are completely encrusted with rubies, each gemstone precisely cut, individually cut, to fit into the setting. The earrings at the bottom are in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. They formed part of the cabinet of curiosities that was collected for William IV in The Hague. The earrings are set with rubies, emeralds and pearls and decorated with very, very fine granulation. Both earrings are known, in, in, known as the current fool jhumka or dangling ear flowers. Similar earrings you can see here, the three princesses from Mysore wearing in this uh, painting that dates to the early 18th century by the artist Thomas Hickey. Among neck jewels, my first choice is a beautiful champakli necklace which is now in the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha. The necklace is in the form of a row of stylized buds of the Michaelia champaka flower. It is set with magnificent old cut and rose cut diamonds in front and decorated with lotus flowers on the reverse. While the provenance of the necklace is unknown, it appears to be almost identical to the one worn by Udaiji Rao Pawar, who was the Maharaja of Dhar from practically the same period. Jewels dispel anonymity. They proclaim caste, religion, and ethnic identity, and even unequivocally communicate an individual's region of origin. This is particularly the case among tribal and pastoral communities around India. Massive silver wadlo trocks are worn by Rabari women in Gujarat, Rajasthan. Similar, Wadlows. While the rigid chalk, this one, with the rectangular cuboid in the middle, instantly identifies the wearer as a girl from the Fakirani Jat community of the Thar Desert region in Rajasthan. <coughs> Both these jewels 
are manufactured by humble craftsmen in desert villages, but are strikingly modern and beautifully constructed. This outstanding 19th century talk or hustle from Rajasthan is my next choice. My selection driven by the extremely unusual and stunningly beautiful luminous green enamel on a white ground on the rivers. The flowers on the front are set with diamonds and rubies. Now the term hustle is derived from hustle or collarbone. When worn, the jewel rests on the collarbone, hence the name hustle. Incidentally, it is also the location of the thyroid gland and such jewels, it is believed, were intended to keep the thyroid stimulated. Now, the placement of jewels on different parts of the body was therefore not just decorative, but had physiological importance as well. According to a branch of ancient Indian science known as Marma Shastra, there are vital points along energy pathways in the body, and the placement of ornaments on these points gently stimulates the area and kept the body both physically and emotionally in equilibrium. Armbands were worn around a vital energy point in the body. Hence, amulets, tavis, and powerful gemstones were all incorporated into armbands. Keeping with the amuletic function, my selections are of jade. Jade had talismanic properties with the power to confer immortality on the wearer. The exquisitely, the exquisitely carved um, nephrite jade flower on the right, this one, is from the Al Saba collection. The jewel is designed as a marigold blossom with perfectly delineated overlapping petals. You can see that each of these petals are overlapping the other. This kind of hybridization between hard jade and the delicate beauty of a flower is a hallmark of Indian lapidary skills. The piece on the left is also a jade armband from the 17th century heyday of the Mughal Empire. In this instance, the jade is inlaid with gold, exquisitely carved, engraved, and the tiger figure in the middle is set with cabochon rubies. All these are cabochon rubies individually cut to form the body of the tiger. In the ability to visualize design, and execute such unique pieces lies the exceptional genius of the craftsmanship. This bazuban, the armband, was actually converted into a brooch by Cartier in the early 20th century. In the Arthashastra, Kautilya also states that the trade route across Dakshinapata or South India is the superior route, for it is rich in mines and abounds in diamonds, rubies, pearls, and gold. The Golconda diamond mines were in the Deccan. Rubies and emeralds from Eva and Mogok in Burma, and Mudzo and Chivor in Colombia poured into the gem bazaars of the Deccan. The pearl fisheries were located off the Coromandel coast over here in the Deccan. And all the gold that flowed into India from time immemorial was for the purchase of luxury commodities like textiles and pepper, all products of this region known as the Deccan. As a result, the syncretic culture that blossomed in the region was unlike any that existed in India. The Deccan, gun, the Deccan was a hunting ground for gems and jewels and works of art for the Mughals. Akbar sent his emissary Asad Beg to the Deccan, instructing him, and I quote, from the Akbar Nama, collect whatever they may have of fine elephants and rare jewels throughout their dominions. End of quote. Therefore, I now move to the Deccan as a hunting ground for jewels for my treasury. My first choice is a masterpiece of the Deccani idiom. This is a turban ornament. It dates to the early 17th century. Set with large table cut diamonds, the center diamond if you look, is cut in, in a mango shape, specially cut for the jewel. The reverse at the bottom is particularly stunning, enameled with red, golden yellow, and green hibiscus flowers on a pale blue and white ground. 
The spinner drop at the bottom is actually inscribed with the name of Jahangir. Now the debate on enameling continues among scholars, but I believe that enameling entered India through the Portuguese enclave of Goa into the Deccan. The sophistication, finesse, and color, platter, color palette of Deccan enameling is exceptional, and the most important and incredible milestones of this art form are in the Al Sabah collection. You can see two examples on the screen in front of you. The enamel motifs on the reverse of the two pendants are simple and elegant, and the color palette is striking, both quintessential features of the Deccan. In the Deccan, sorry, in the Deccan, Hyderabad emerged as an important center of enameling. And the next few pieces come from the treasury of the Nizams of Hyderabad. The enameled surface, as you can see in these pendants, is not crowded. The emphasis on delicate floral designs. The palette is vibrant with delicate touches of white. Monochrome black, white, and green enamel are typical of the Hyderabad Meenakar and can be seen in this beautiful 18th century turban ornaments from the Nizam of Hyderabad's collection. While the front is set with Golconda diamonds over here, the reverse is enameled in white and black, both exceptional features of the Deccan. And in this photograph of the young Prince Salabadja, you can see the same jewel wrapped around his cap. <clears throat> now, the Portuguese arrived in India in 1498, and in 1510, they seized the port of Goa and established their Estado da India, that is, their empire in the Orient. Goa became the hub of the gem trade. Goa was the place where the Portuguese did the greatest business in Asia, and my next selections are therefore from Goa. This fabulous pendant dates to the 17th century. It was made in Goa. Set with diamonds and cabochon rubies in front, the minutely detailed engrav engraving on the reverse depicts lions, lionesses, and gazelles amidst flowers and vines, reminiscent of hunting scenes depicted in miniature paintings and textiles of the period. Portuguese influence in man is manifest in this gold tiara-like comb, also from Goa, known as the Dantoni. It dates to the early 19th century, it's fashioned from sheet gold and worked in repuse. Bijual combs form part of traditional Goan costume, visible in this portrait of a Goan woman. You can she see she's wearing a tiara comb, not unlike the one on the right side of the screen. From the Deccan, designs, techniques, and skills travel north into the Mughal court, where they coalesced with Mughal artistic sensibilities to produce the quintessential Mughal-style jewelry, which we all know as Kundan Meena, or just Jadao, a unique combination of gold, gems, and enamel. To the Mughal emperors, gems and jewels were symbols of power and sovereignty, and more importantly, of leg legitimacy. My choice from the Mughal treasury is two extraordinary jewels now in the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. The beautiful archer's ring at the bottom is set with diamonds, rubies, and emeralds. On the inside, within a cartouche done in Partaji Kam over here, is Shah Jahan's name, outlined in gold calligraphy and inlaid with minutely cut rubies. The bangles on top encapsulate the essence of Mughal aesthetics. There is incredible precision and visual perfection in the pair. 547 large and small rubies are set with three old cut diamonds. The inner side is enameled with delicate white narcissus, if you can see the narcissus flowers, on a translucent green enamel ground. Both jewels were looted by Nadir Shah from the Mughal treasury and sent as diplomatic gifts to Empress Elizabeth of Russia. While the jewelry of the rich and affluent combine gold and gemstones, the language of folk jewelry is expressed primarily in silver. 
Gold and silver were essential to the Indian way of life. Gold was a symbol of sun and fire, whereas silver was a symbol of moon and water. The gold necklace on the right, on the left side, is known as the Gauri Shankram. It's made of sheet gold, whereas the silver anklets, the two silver anklets on the right, were crafted in the deserts of Rajasthan, worn by tribal women to whom it constituted a form of savings. In Sanskrit, the diamond is referred to as Vajra or Thunderbolt or the weapon of Indra. The Ratna Pariksha, and you can see the quote on the screen in front of you, says that if there is diamond anywhere in the world which is completely transparent, light with a beautiful color, even if it is only the size of an atom, then it is indeed a gift from God. Every effort was made in ancient India to preserve maximum mass and the weight of the stones. While geometry was important, symmetry was not considered essential to draw out the fire from a diamond. Sorry. Fabulous diamonds and exquisite workmanship come together in two pieces from the Hyderabad treasury. This one is a belt buckle. You can see it actually being worn by the young Nizam VI, Mir Mahbub Ali Khan, in this photograph taken in 1882. The front of the buckle is set with old cut and rose cut diamonds in the, a design of lotus blossoms, while the back is finely etched, the gold of the back is finely etched with floral motives, very reminiscent of the bidri work of the Deccan. And this spectacular diamond belt, also from the Nizam's treasury, set with 822 carats of golden colored Golconda diamonds. The belt was actually designed by Oscar Massin very famous French jeweler of the late 19th century and crafted in his workshop. It took them eight months to make this belt. And also from the Nizam's treasury are these beautiful anklets set with parallel rows of Golconda diamonds. If you look closely at the lady from the Zanana, she's wearing what looks to be an identical pair. In ancient gemology texts, rubies were classified according to their color. Padma Raga was red like lotus. Purplish ones were called Jamunya from the fruit Jamun. And gems with a hint of blue or black were called Nilagandhi. Some of the most, the two necklaces that you see on the screen are classical jewels of the south, known as the Vaijanti Mala. They are set, both pieces are set with the most beautiful collection of Burmese cabochon rubies. Emeralds poured into India from the 16th century. They came from Colombia and South America. The Mughals were passionately fond of the gem and collected them in large quantities. Green was the color of paradise and emeralds were a symbol of eternal life. From the Al Sabah collection and the Islam Museum of Islamic Art Doha, these are my two favorites. The emerald bead on the left side is one of the most fabulous. They both gems exhibit attest to the extraordinary genius of the gem cutter who was able to see the form of this narcissus blossom in a rough emerald stone and placed the flower exactly in the center of the bead with such delicate precision. And this beautiful brooch, which was made by Cartier, reset by Cartier in 1937, from an old emerald. The gem is carved in amazing detail and you can see two figures. There is a mother and the child on her lap. And the inspiration for such carving was, the theme appears to be very European. And the inspiration for this carving probably originated from 17th century works, such as this one by Pierre Mignard that you see on the right. The, the um, European missionary, missionaries and ambassadors to the Mughal court presented the emperor with portraits and paintings. And the gem was most likely carved in Goa, inspired by one such painting. Now, in my most recent book, Treasures of the Deccan, pieces of jewelry that are scattered in faraway collections come home and are reunited with royal members who once wore them. This armlet with the hexagonal Colombian emerald, beautifully carved with chrysanthemum flowers, did not have a provenance. The Abamban is in the Al Sabah collection, but we now know 
that it belonged to Dulhan Pasha Begum, principal wife of Mir Osman Ali Khan, who seeing this jewel, you can see it here and you can see the detail here, in this photograph that dates to circa 1915. Now, pearls were treasured in India. And my next choice is this beautiful Baroque pearl pendant, which is now in the Althani collection. The jewel dates to the 16th century. It's a composite figure, what appears to be a snake god. It's intertwining tails visible here at the back, set with diamonds, cabochon rubies, and blue glass. As the Mughal Empire declined and eventually collapsed, powerful native courts rose in power throughout India. To the Maharajas, turban jewels were very important. And the one single jewel that proclaimed, it was the one single jewel that proclaimed their sovereignty. And you can see that some, like the Nawab Sadiq Khan of Bahawalpur and the Maharaja of Mysore perhaps took it to an extreme by adorning their turbans with such mammoth jewels. These fabulous sarpeches, also from the Nizam's treasury, the top one set with a beautiful collection of Burmese spinels and rubies, and the one at the bottom with a carved, three carved emeralds set with diamonds. Again, they are united with the people to whom they belonged. I recently discovered this photograph of the princes Azamja and Muazamja actually wearing these two jewels. North or South, East or West, turban jewels were de rigueur across India. As can be seen in these two examples, the one on the left is from Mysore in South India, and one on the right in the royal collection in England, which was gifted to Albert Edward, the Prince of Wales, by the Maharaja of Udaipur. For women, objects or ornaments were objects of seduction and allurement. And as you can see in this miniature painting of Radha and Krishna from the Punjab hills, Radha is draped only near sheer dupatta, but is adorned with all her jewels. And beautiful poet verse from Jayadeva's Gita Govinda is shown on the right side of the screen. Now, the last few uh, slides, I'm coming more into the 19th century. The Maharani's of India were no less bejeweled. This beautiful chintak, collar necklace, was made in large quantities in the zanana of the Nizam of Hyderabad. The magnificent example on the screen is set with beautiful table-cut diamonds. And the photograph on top shows six wives of Mir Osman Ali Khan each one adorned with an identical set of jewels, and all of them are wearing these chintaks or collar necklaces. My next choice is prompted not only by the beauty of the jewel, but for the romance behind it. This is Anita Delgado. She was a Spanish flamenco dancer who was seen by Jagajit Singh, the Maharaja of Kapurthala. It was a fairy tale romance at that time. Now, Delgado records in her diary that one day in the palace, she saw the, the royal elephant wearing a beautiful emerald on its forehead, and she became infatuated by it and begged the king to give it to her. And he gave her this beautiful um, crescent moon-shaped emerald, which is set in this beautiful bell epoch uh, design. She wore it as a forehead jewel here, as you can see in this photograph and sometimes as a pendant. In the 19th century of the British Raj, jewels functioned as a means of expressing allegiance to the king. And the examples in front of you are from Bengal, from Murshidabad. They actually depict the coat of arms of the Nawab Nizam of Murshidabad, Bengal. It was a way of expressing their allegiance to the British Empire. The love affair between Europe and India climaxed in the early 20th century and manifests itself in ornament types, design, and manufacturing techniques. The great European jewelry houses, Cartier, Van Cleef & Appel, Chaumet, Maubasson, and others, all turned to India for inspiration. They created such jewels, which was a new genre in design that married Indian color, motives, and forms with European elegance and techniques. The resulting idiom was unique, exotic, sensual, and beautiful. The necklace here 
is inspired from this mango necklace, the Manga Male of South India, which was made by Cartier Paris. And the piece on the right is inspired by this armband transformed into this diamond, uh, ruby, sapphire, and emerald brooch by Van Cleef and Arpels. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is my treasury. I end with the words of Al Masudi, a 17th century Arab traveler who wrote, and I quote, India is the most agreeable abode on the earth and the most pleasant quarter of the world. Its dust is purer than air, its air purer than purity itself. Its delightful plains resemble the garden of paradise and the particles of its earth are like rubies and corals. So in jewels, India is the treasury of the world. Thank you. <laughs>